So for me, it was more an art project to see what my body would look like when I train a certain way. Then I went to the first competition and actually got placed second. And with that, I qualified for the German championships. And then quickly after the German championships, I qualified for the European championships. And I was just amazed and overwhelmed by the energy it gave me because I used to train always by myself. It doesn't matter how fast the pace is and if you think I should be faster, it doesn't matter. It also doesn't matter how fast anybody else is. It won't make you faster if somebody else is faster. Hello and welcome to the Art of Health podcast where we dive deep into the art of unlocking your true potential and transforming your health, aesthetics and performance. In today's episode, I want to talk about my running journey because I received a bunch of questions from you guys through Instagram DMs and on my YouTube channel, how I started running, how I design my programming right now and what is my current goal, how I increased my pace over the past weeks, how I changed my nutrition, if I still have my menstrual cycle and all these things. And you also asked how you can start running if you are a beginner or if you just want to restart your running journey, which we also dive into today. So today will be more of a Q&A podcast episode. And I hope that this episode is inspiring you to start maybe your running journey or just to start a new style of training that you haven't tried out because you may have been afraid to be a beginner again or you don't know how to start and you just need the little push to go out of your comfort zone. So I'm going to share my journey right now with you. And the first question of today is how I actually started running because you guys saw me doing strength training, you saw me doing lots of handstands and all of a sudden you only see me running now. Throughout my whole fitness career, I have changed my training focus in different phases of my life. And my background is actually hip hop dancing, which I started when I was around four or five years old. And I did that until I was a teenager. And then I was impressed by the physique of some dancers. So I saw their six packs. Some of them had really crazy muscle and I looked at myself and I was never overweight or anything, but I also didn't have visible muscle and that was super impressive to me. So I wanted to see how I can change my physique and being so impressed by the physiques, I understood, okay, I might need to do something more than just dancing. And I went to the gym with the age of 16 and I was obsessed with the goal of building muscle and I wasn't unhappy with my body it didn't came from a place of being sad or obsessive in a way or not really confident in my body it was just that I was seeing how you can still change your body even though we were born with a certain physique and genetics but you can still have an influence on your appearance with the way you eat and the way you train so for me, it was more an art project to see what my body would look like when I train a certain way. So I read magazines, talked to trainers at my gym and informed myself through the Internet about what I needed to eat and how I needed to train in order to get visible muscle. So I trained hard for two years with the knowledge that I gathered and one or two years later, after being pretty regularly at the gym and eating more protein and just cut out some of the sweets that I used to eat, didn't drink alcohol anymore, I saw visible changes and the trainers would come to me and ask me at my gym if I would do bodybuilding and if I would want to do a competition one day. And I said, no, I just wanted to train to see how I can change my physique, but I'm not taking any drugs and I'm not a bodybuilder. So I was like a little bit surprised that people would ask me because I wasn't <laughs> huge at this point. I had visible muscle, but for me, a bodybuilder, especially a woman, was something so 
extreme. And then I googled and saw that there are different categories in bodybuilding and there was a bikini division. They basically look muscular but still like normal women, let's say. They didn't look too manly in my eyes and I thought it would be a nice challenge to go to a competition like that. So then I went to the first competition and actually got placed second. And with that, I qualified for the German championships. And then quickly after the German championships, I qualified for the European championships. Then I was kind of in that bodybuilding bubble because I saw I have potential and I kept competing for four years. Then I finally finished my bodybuilding career with a bronze medal at the world championship and It was more than I ever thought I could achieve. But after that, I wanted to explore than just training for aesthetics. And I set myself new goals like learning a handstand and a muscle up. And I traveled all over the world and I worked with different high level gymnasts to develop a diverse training style. So I changed my training after bodybuilding to functional strength, lots of mobility and just learning specific skills like a press to handstand, a muscle up, a weighted muscle up, a pistol squat, handstand walks and so on. And after being so rigid in my bodybuilding times, a new training style felt just like freedom and exploring different movements. It opened up my horizon and intention to work out. And throughout this whole entire time, I enjoyed running like one or two times per week without having a pace in mind or a certain distance in mind. And I just did it when I wanted to do something different than going to the gym or when I was mentally not feeling so good, because that's what I love about running. It always gave me so much clarity whenever I was confused or had an argument with somebody or just something was going on in my mind, it had a clearing effect. So it was more to reach a mental state through running at this point. Running has always been enjoyable for me, but it was never a focus until last year when I went for a trail run with my husband and his company, like the whole team. And that was the Hood to Coast Run in Portland, Oregon, which is a 24-hour run that is accomplished by the entire team. So everyone gets assigned different routes. Some are hilly, some are in the heat, some are in the middle of the day, some are longer, some shorter, and some are in the middle of the night. And each team member was celebrated for what he or she can accomplish and the vibe was just so much fun like thousands of people attended and dressed up in funny costumes or holding funny signs and cheering for the runners there was small big young old beginners and advanced people and they were all just running however they could and I was just amazed and overwhelmed by the energy it gave me because I used to train always by myself and even bodybuilding was something I did for myself and this was something that you do with people together still run by yourself but the energy and the cheering I didn't know this feeling I noticed that this is something different that I want to experience again and at this point I didn't have any training goal I used to have always a goal like building muscle or learning more skills and at this point I was fine with everything. I achieved so many things for, for myself that I never thought I could and then I just wanted to have a next goal, something to train for to see what my body is capable of and I just registered for the Hermannslauf which is in my hometown Bielefeld which is in Germany. And my family is running or hiking it every year. It's a 31 kilometer trail run, which is very challenging because of many ups and downs and different surfaces you need to run on. So I'm afraid, <laughs> but I wanted to do it because I thought it would be a cool family thing to do. And it's a nice um Yeah, I think it's a nice race to prep for because a half marathon, I haven't run a half marathon at this point, was a nice goal, but a marathon was kind of too crazy at this point. And the 32 or 31 kilometer race sounded like a challenging but doable goal. So yeah, that's how I started focusing on running. And the next question I want to cover 
is how often do you run and how I am structuring my running workouts. As I approached all my goals, I hired a running coach to write me a plan to stick to. I could have written a plan for myself, but I like to learn from people who are experts. And this made me more confident because I wasn't sure how quickly I could increase my running volume to avoid getting injured or overtrained. And since I'm writing workouts and plans for my own clients, I didn't want to think about my own training on top of that. So I tend to overthink for myself, which I think many of us do. And that's why I was handing this over to an external person with a more objective view. And that's super valuable for me. And honestly, this was the best decision I could have made because my running coach made sure I started really, really slow with increasing volume each week. Even though I could already easily run a 10K, she planned like three to 4K runs, but therefore in a higher frequency per week, so that my body could adjust slowly without getting injuries. And with increasing running each week, I automatically adjusted my strength training to first lighter and shorter sessions, and now also to way less strength training because I need the time to rest in between. And we were pretty quickly at a frequency of four to five sessions per week. So I have typically one easy run, then a tempo run, another easy run, and the easy runs are also usually shorter, then a rest day, then a, another long run, and then an easy run. Yeah, so that I have like five sessions and two of them are more intense because of the long run and the tempo run. And the other ones are more to adapt my body to running more often and to just accumulate more distance throughout the week without getting like overtrained. So it's very important that you have easy sessions and higher intensity sessions. Another question that I want to throw into this topic is how I combine strength and running. So as I mentioned, I was really decreasing my strength training because I used to train only strength four to five times per week. And whenever I felt like it, I throwed a running session in, but that was really sporadic. So it was mostly strength and conditioning work. And now I'm training maximum two times strength per week as I'm getting closer to my race. Obviously, I need to decrease my overall intensity right now. I'm in the tapering week, so I don't want to get sore anymore. I, we decreased my running volume a lot because I'm now two weeks out from my race. When you listen to this episode, I already did my race. But um, right now I barely do any strength, just a little bit of stability, mobility training and exactly the sessions that I'm posting on my YouTube channel because I'm recording them. So obviously I did them. And when I record them, that's my training. But in the beginning of my running prep, like when I was four months or five months out to two months out, I tried to have two strength sessions, like solid sessions where I went to the gym and used more weights. But I was already very conscious of, okay, how can I train in a way that benefits my running? So lots of stability, single leg work. Um, some explosive work but not too much because you need to be aware of the intensity with everything together and um, mobility so lots of glute stuff because many runners have underdeveloped glutes and that's how you get injured because then your knees and joints need to work more if your glutes are not properly trained especially your glute medius so when you go on my youtube channel you will see the strength workouts for runners and we do lots of stability and glute medius work to counterbalance the running. So you guys also asked me what's the best way to combine strength and running and that depends so much on your goal because you can either say okay running is my focus or maybe you prep for a half marathon or a marathon then strength is superior and then you need to adjust your strength according to your running. So maybe you have more like me, two strength sessions or 
two full body and one really light core session and stability that has a low impact but that doesn't make you sore or where you don't aim for progressive overload all the time and if you say I want to get better in both and maybe change your physique build muscle at the same time then I recommend doing three strength sessions and one or two running sessions so in my hybrid body program in my workout app we do two running sessions one tempo one long run and three functional based uh, gym workout sessions that are aiming to build muscle but also to get strong and flexible as you guys know mobility is a big part of my life it's so underrated and that's always incorporated in my workouts so the workout app would be for somebody that wants to improve running and strength but if you are prepping for a certain race then you might want to adjust your strength a little bit more to your running and see it as accessory work so then you you can aim for progressive overload and increase your weights but the closer you are to a race you need to just focus on one thing so you're not getting overtrained or harm your running workouts that are obviously more important if you want to hit a great time on your race all right guys so the next question you asked me what my goal is so my goal right now is to do the race in under three hours so it's 31 kilometers and it has lots of elevation I believe 600 meter maybe even more so it's lots of up and downs and this is a whole nother level because when I run outside here, I don't have any elevation. I just did one test run, which was a half marathon race. And it was a similar route because that's supposed to be like the prep or test run for the Hermannslauf. And this run was intense. <laughs> I first wanted to use it as a fun run and just say okay I have fun today it's a test race it's my first race that I ever did in running but then I went all out <laughs> I couldn't help but try to see what's in me and I'm glad that I did it because I saw what I'm capable of so I ran the 21 kilometers with over 500 meter elevation in one hour and 48 minutes I believe and I, at this point, I couldn't believe running another 10K, especially with lots of up and downs, which would be the Hermannslauf. So my goal is to so my goal is to make the Hermannslauf in under three hours. And I have a very optimistic goal in mind, but I also know that everything needs to be in place in order for me to achieve that. Like weather conditions, maybe it's super hot, obviously, the past weeks I wasn't training in heat so when it's super hot that will change my performance I never run the actual route so it's a different route up and downs will immensely change my pace um, maybe yeah side stitches so knock on wood I hope I don't get side stitches because I had that in the race and sometimes when it was when I did tempo runs because of the different breathing you do so I got some exercises from my physio, which are so helpful, but I hope that I can train my like my breathing muscles until then because I've only two weeks. And yeah, I just hope that I don't get side stitches because it's just annoying. You can't keep up with a certain pace when it's so painful. What else? Yeah, then your menstrual cycle can influence your performance, obviously. But all of these factors I can't control. So I don't even want to waste time to think about them. I only focus right now in these upcoming two weeks on the things that I can focus on and that's how I eat, how I sleep, my stress management, my mindset and yeah just doing the training sessions <laughs> that I have left which are fairly easy compared to the last months because again a tapering week is almost like deloading because you want to be really fresh for the race yeah I'm very excited for that and curious what my body is capable of because one good or positive thing that we need to account for when racing is the adrenaline that we don't usually have in training because nobody is on the side and is cheering you up but on a race day 
people are cheering for you you hear them you know maybe some of your friends or family members are there and i know that this is for me at least a big push so i hope that helps to get the extra percentage out of my performance and i just do what i can and most importantly nobody gets injured after that i will do the portland run again in august with my husband so we do it as a team but this is really meant to be fun there is no go to win anything and it's just to have a nice time with with the whole team of his work and they are also yeah close friends of ours and just yeah having a good time and then i might be able to do the berlin marathon in september but i don't know if i still can get a spot because you usually have to register i think one year prior which i didn't and i didn't even know that <laughs> so um Yeah, maybe I get a spot through my manager who is like connected to some people. Maybe if somebody is not um, able to run, but yeah, I'm not planning on that. If it happens, cool, because it would fit very well into my whole year of training since I was training for the 30K and then I could just continue to do the 40K. So I already have the adaptation that I can build on. So yeah, let's see. I'll keep you posted. All right. Then the next question was, how were you able to increase your pace so quickly first of all i want to say that quickly is relative everybody starts at a different point everybody has a different fitness everybody has a different body type and i want you to be aware that i was focusing on it over now six months so i'm not running once per week i'm running Five times a week, I adjusted my nutrition, my recovery, my training. Everything I focused on was increasing my running pace. I also told you that I hired a coach who is doing my plan and also prescribed uh, paces based on my performance. And I always had a certain level of fitness. I was able to do a 10k easily in one under one hour so I had a baseline that I could build on I wasn't a complete beginner I would say but um, yeah based on that I focused only on that and of course I was a little bit in a honeymoon phase because I never focused on running so there is a good chance to increase my pace in the next months because there's still so much room and potential Maybe in one year, if I continue like that and use my full potential, I won't make big jumps anymore. Then they are probably smaller jumps. Because when you compare that to strength, I always tell that my clients that want to build muscle or want to increase strength, the less experience you have, the more progress you will see in the first weeks. Because you never did it. Your body has so much more room to improve or increase strength. Whereas when you are a professional athlete, let's say my husband who used to be a professional weightlifter, when he was able to increase his snatch PR by 0.5 kilograms in a year full of training, five hours per day, then this was good progress because he was already so advanced. You always have to keep that in mind. And I know that some people ask me, yeah, I'm running once per week and I'm not able to increase my pace. Doing something once a week won't let your body adapt. So it doesn't matter what you do. You saw me learning a handstand. You saw me building muscle. You saw me learning a muscle up and all these things. I always ensure that I have minimum two sessions of this specific skill, whatever you want to achieve per week, because that's the minimum that your body needs to have to adapt. So there is a curve of recovery. When you hit a stimulus, your body needs like 48 hours to recover. And then ideally you hit the next stimulus two or three days after, or it's, it's just don't take it too serious in particular, but round about like two or three days after where you then hit the next stimulus to build on this adaptation. If you have only one session of anything per week, then you have the adaptation curve and then adaptation goes down again because there is no stimulus that was hit at the point where it were, would have been able to been increased. I hope that made sense. 
you also call this super compensation. No matter what, we don't need to go into the whole science, no matter what you're doing, two sessions of the specific thing you want to achieve needs to be incorporated into your workout plan. If not even more, but that depends on your whole schedule. What else are you doing? What's your actual goal? How do you recover and so on? But one more thing I want to address for increasing running pace specifically is incorporating interval runs. If you want to increase your pace, then intervals are a really great tool to let your body adapt to a faster pace. And that doesn't need to be sprints. We were working with all different ranges. So sometimes I had 400 meter repeats at a certain pace. Sometimes I had 800. Sometimes I had holding a harder pace for 4K. So it was always very different. That's why I recommend hiring a running coach that can sort of build a plan for you to progressively increase your running pace. But as important as tempo runs are, you need to work on the basics as well, like zone two cardio training, as many people like to call it. It's just accumulating distance at an easy pace where you could talk to somebody, we can listen to a podcast, maybe call somebody, a friend or a family member. That's what I like to do. Some people ask me like, oh my God, how can you run 26K on a treadmill? And I didn't have as much problems with it as I thought. <laughs> I had to do some of my long runs in the winter and sometimes it was super cold and icy. So I went to the gym and did my long runs on the treadmill. And obviously I slowly adjusted. I didn't just start and did my first run on the treadmill and it was a 26K. I did shorter runs before and adapted my body to the treadmill. But when I did these really long runs, I just called my mom or I listened to a podcast and brainstormed maybe about my business or something that I wanted to think about. And that helped me to not feeling bored, <laughs> obviously, but also helped me to keep the pace that I should be at because very easily people run too fast on their easy runs and they're supposed to be slow so when you say oh my god I could never imagine talking to somebody while running then you're running too fast it doesn't matter how fast the pace is and if you think I should be faster it doesn't matter it also doesn't matter how fast anybody else is it won't make you faster if somebody else is faster, because there will always be somebody that's faster and there will always be somebody that's slower. It doesn't change your progress or your ability to run. Just make sure that you rate your pace on a scale. I like to work with RPE. You can Google that from one to 10 and your easy runs should be at an RPE two to three. So you can talk. Of course, you need to breathe in between, but it's easy for you to talk. So I think that's a good way to gauge that easy run pace. All right, the next question we have is, did you notice any knee pain or other sorts of injury? Thankfully not. <laughs> I didn't notice any pain. At the beginning of increasing the running volume, I felt one side of my glute medius, but I talked to some physios and ultra runners and professionals in that field. And they said that could be just the adaptation pain, like my muscles need to adapt to the high frequency of running and yeah, making so many steps and just the volume itself. And I made sure that I incorporate a glute medius routine before running, stability work and mobility, and then it went away. So whenever you notice something like some aches and pain and it doesn't feel like a lot and maybe it goes away at some point during the day then don't ignore it because most injuries occur because some people ignored some little things and then all of a sudden they ripped a tendon or something like this and um, develop a serious knee injury or hip injury so whenever I have something small I notice it immediately in my body I think also because I'm pretty flexible so whenever something feels tight I feel it immediately and I want to get rid of it so I form roll it or I explore with different stretches and see how I can make it better 
And I also like to go once per month, not always once per month, but now, especially in my running prep where intensity is so high, I like to go to a chiropractor or physio and just get an adjustment. Even though I don't have anything, I like to go because there's always something <laughs> you can adjust and it feels so good. It's also good for the nervous system and it's, yeah, it's amazing. So finding a good chiropractor or physio or somebody that can do both is very valuable. Make sure you Google chiropractor and look for good ratings and see if he can help you. And one more thing I noticed recently was through my side stitches, I had like really tight muscle because the diaphragm I believe it is that needs to work and gets like a spasm when you run and get the side stitches um, it contracts so the muscle tone was just really high and I went to my physio and he massaged it and then it was good so he showed me some breathing techniques and I hope that this will help <laughs> a lot and that I won't get the side stitches Uh, on my race day but that was the only like the only two little things with it was more like muscular tightness that I experienced um, how can I learn a good running style I did some workshops but not a lot with a running coach his name is Chris Hinshaw that helped and I also watched some YouTube tutorials but that was years ago And now in my prep, I don't change my running style because with that, you could potentially harm your body more than doing something good. So if you change your running style, then do it at the beginning of a prep or in an off season and not close to a race. Keep your natural running style until your race day if it's very close to it and then after um, you can change it. How did your nutrition change and how many calories do you eat? And did you notice any changes in your hunger level? I will pair this question with the question if I notice a change in my menstrual cycle. Because nutrition and your menstrual cycle are always linked together. I did pay very close attention to my nutrition because I knew that the running could potentially lead to longer cycles, which I wanted to avoid. Many people that know me for a long time and experienced my journey and followed my journey knew that through bodybuilding, I lost my period. So I had hypothalamic amenorrhea, which is very common when you have such a low body fat percentage and just eating so restrictive. And then after that, my whole goal was to get my period back. And I did that, I got my period back and now I want to keep it, of course. So I was thinking with the running, I need to be extra careful because of my history. Your cycle is even more sensitive when you had once hypothalamic amenorrhea. So I was intentionally increasing my carbs around my training. I was intentionally eating every morning something even though I wasn't hungry because these are the times when your body would go in survival mode if it doesn't get food. We are already putting stress on our body. I have lots of work to do. I'm stressed sometimes. I sometimes can't um, sleep as long as I want or I travel a lot. All these things are stressors so I wanted to control what I can control and that's food intake. Making sure I get high quality food I also like to enjoy myself and drink a glass of wine once in a while or eating some chocolates or something. But the main focus was on eating enough, especially in the mornings, before my runs and after. And then, of course, I eat in the evening as well. But these are the time frames where your body could feel like there is not enough and therefore be in a survival mode. And that would shut down your cycle because it thinks, okay, I don't have enough resources to reproduce hormones, to reproduce a cycle and definitely not go through a pregnancy and feed a child. And that's why many athletes get hypothalamic amenorrhea. And I wanted to avoid that. So yeah, I increased carbs, I increased calories because... I noticed quickly with longer runs that my hunger didn't match my caloric expense. So I ran so much and I saw like how many calories I was burning, even though the watch is not super accurate, but I knew it was much more than I used to. But my hunger level wasn't as high. So I really needed to force myself to eat, especially on those long run days. And it's 
pretty common that it can suppress hunger on that day. It usually catches up the next day or the day after for me. So I was making sure I eat less fiber because it's easier to eat for me. When I eat a big salad, I can't eat much and I won't have eaten many calories, not the calories that I needed to match my running output. So I was trying to drink a smoothie sometimes. I experiment with a lot of things. Mm. I also like at the moment just eating toast with peanut butter and jam or avocado or cheese and things that are delicious to me and easy to make and easy to digest. That's what I'm eating. Sometimes I eat cottage cheese with some oats or granola and lots of dates, which are great for running because they also contain potassium. And that's also very important when you run or other dried fruits and nut butters because they are very high in calories. They're really good sources of fat. We need not only more carbs as runners, but also sufficient protein and fats protein for muscle recovery and we want to keep lean mass as much as possible to support our joints and ligaments and we need the healthy fats to reproduce our hormones so it's important to always look at your plate and look if you have enough protein carbs and fats for our calories in total i try to track my calories at the beginning just to make sure that i'm eating enough and i was always trying to reach for 3000 or 3000 plus calories on my long runs and i increased the longer my runs were and the more i had to accumulate so right now i don't track my calories but i tracked it at the beginning and i now stick with the eating patterns and amount that I started with and add on whenever I have like really intense days in terms of noticing changes in my menstrual cycle. Thank God I didn't. So I was so happy when at the beginning of my prep that my period was still coming. But one cycle, the last one was really long, longer than I wanted. And I always like to look at what could have caused it because I was flying to New York City. So I had a big time change I was doing a long run there in the Central Park which was beautiful but also very stressful for my body I felt kind of sick there for two days then I flew back then I had a shooting somewhere where it was a little bit cold then I was actually getting sick for one week and I yeah had lots of stressors around all of this and that's most likely what led to the longer cycle and it's okay because I can't always control everything. I want to live my life and I don't want to live in a vacuum just to have a 28 day cycle all the time because that's not fulfilling for me. So I am very aware of all the factors that I can control. Eight hours of sleep per night, eating enough, drinking enough, meditating when I feel like it's a, it's a lot at the moment or saying no to some social activities when I don't feel like it. All these things are helpful for me to reduce stress, for example, and to maintain a healthy cycle. And if it's one time a little bit longer, it's not like necessarily super unhealthy. It's just part of my life to also be an athlete and to enjoy my training and to work hard and it's um, it's okay and it's good to not stress about this one longer cycle and just continue and see okay what can I do maybe better the next time or what does need more focus in this cycle okay and lastly I want to talk about how you can start with running if you have never ran or if you consider yourself as a beginner. My first recommendation is that you really start slow. So many people that tell me, oh, I wish I would love running, but I hate it. I ask them, okay, what's your experience with running? And that, yeah, I'm super fast, exhausted, or I get shin splints. All of these things are already a sign for me that you started too fast because your first run shouldn't lead you to shin splints or feeling super exhausted. Your first run should be maybe a 2k maybe a 3k really slow and enjoyable where you can talk of course it can be challenging because it's new to you but you shouldn't feel like you're dying afterwards and especially people that are already sporty tend to run too fast because they're used to a certain intensity like how they train and it's hard for them to pace themselves so start slow at a pace where you can talk and just make your first runs so that you enjoy them and build on that trust that you will increase your pace. But 
don't start too fast at the beginning. And it is very helpful to start with somebody else that can make you accountable for your pace and maybe that you can talk with and enjoy the running time. I think that's the beauty of running. You can do it everywhere with everyone and choose a nice route. If the weather is good, then it's even better. But even if it's raining, I think it can be just such a nice thing to do for your body to be outside and then have a nice shower. And I just love this feeling afterwards. So yeah, starting slow is very important. And it's important to incorporate your runs twice per week if you want to get serious about it or get better at it and feel better. Because again, once per week is just too little to make adaptations. The next tip I can give you is not running in your shoes that you have at home or in your training shoes, but actual running shoes, because you can get shin splints or some other types of injury and it can make the run also less fun if you don't have the right running shoes. I can't tell you which shoes you should wear because you need to do an analysis or just go to a sports shoe shop and ask people which shoes they recommend for you and just test one out. Usually you can test them and bring them back if they don't work at all for you. The next point is doing your running warm-ups and cool down and I, I always feel like I'm the boring person and it's the thing that nobody wants to hear but warming up and cooling down can change your performance tremendously and it's just five minutes before your run and after these five minutes that you invest each before and after running can actually not only improve your running but also avoid injury where you would spend much more time to recover from if if you ever develop one and we want to avoid that obviously and maybe at the beginning you feel like ah, oh, I can get away without a warm-up but why why you need to risk that for me a warm-up is like cutting vegetables before you cook them you also don't throw a zucchini or an eggplant or a carrot in the pot and cook it you need to cut it before to prep so we need to prep our body for the run, for the movement that it needs to do for multiple reps, for thousands of steps. And it's about pre-activating your muscles that you will use for running and just getting your joints and ligaments smooth and then your running will be much more fun. So just do that right from the beginning to avoid any injury and to make it even more fun. I have lots of YouTube videos that you can just follow along. You just hit play and do a five minute running warm up with me. You don't even need to think about the exercise. And I also have lots of running cool downs and in general mobility routines that you can do after your run. And one other point is that you incorporate some type of strength training. It doesn't need to be at the gym. It can also be at home. Again, I have lots of strength for runners workouts on my YouTube channel to follow along. And that leads me to the next recommendation for beginners or even if if you are an advanced runner, do your strength training. It doesn't need to be long. It doesn't need to be much dependent on how much you run and how much other things you're doing, but they will help you to build resilient joints and ligaments because when running, you always have a bouncing force. And at one point, it might lead to injury if you don't strengthen your muscles and stabilize your muscles. So again, it doesn't need to be at the gym. It can also be at home. And I have lots of strength for runners workout routines on my YouTube channel. Also, all the other full body workout routines are very suitable for that because I always incorporate some stability, strength and mobility work, which is perfect for running. I personally like to do Pilates right now, which is low impact, but still intense. It's really challenging my muscles, but it doesn't seem to harm my running progress as much. So I like throwing in a Pilates session once in a while. I know for some people this looks super easy, but it's not. So I just released a new workout, which is a Pilates workout, and you might want to try it and see that your muscles will burn. <laughs> Trust me. And lastly, fuel your runs. We just talked about it, but if you never ran or if you change your training tremendously like I did, then you need to think a little bit different with running because you really need the carbs. And especially as women or many women out there think, ah, yeah, maybe I run to lose weight or have a certain aesthetic goal, which is fine. Everybody can have an aesthetic goal. If you are, for example, in a caloric deficit and want to run, it can crash you at one point and it can really mess up your hormones if you're not careful. So fuel your runs, eat your carbs, eat your protein, eat your fats, 
and don't cut out on any of these. So yeah, with that, I think we have covered all the most frequently asked questions. If you have any questions left, then please let me know in the comments below. I'm super excited to share my journey with you. I'm excited that you are curious about my journey and that we can talk about it together, that I inspired some of you to also run and explore diverse ways of training because I still like to do hand signs. I still like to do strength and I think it's just so beautiful that we can explore with our body so many different styles of training and have fun with it and just explore the healthy lifestyle to the fullest and um, never do something because we want to work against our bodies but with our bodies and to explore the full potential. I hope that this inspired you and I see you in the next one.